You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Neu formed in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1971 by Michel Rota and Klaus Dinger. Rota and Dinger had joined Kraftwerk before leaving to form their own band. As they began playing as a duo, they booked studio time in Hamburg and asked Connie Plank to produce the sessions. While recording over four nights, they ended up with what would become the first Neu album, released in 1972. In this episode, for the 50th anniversary, Michel Rota looks back on how the album came together. This is The Making of Noi. I'm Michael Rota, you can call me Michael Rother, and I'm here to talk about the first Neue album, which is already 50 years old. I'm, of course, happy to hear that younger generations pick up these ideas, and maybe if they pick up also the, the basic wish, which was the foundation of the music of Neue and my idea about music, to be different, then maybe that would also lead to new unheard music or somebody being immodest, because of course I was quite the opposite of a modest musician. I was, it was quite hilarious to think you could reinvent the wheel, sort of, um, but that was the truth. I, of course, in the beginning when I was 14, 15, 16, and I was listening to the new music that came from Great Britain mostly and some of the music also from the States, but most of that music, Beatles, Stones, Kings, etc., came from Great Britain and it was exciting for me. I had a very bad guitar at home, but my mother was um, so supportive. She endured my endless uh, finger picking um, around notes, making mistakes probably, and probably making terrible music for several years. And then I joined the band Spirits of Sound. There were two people or three people actually for a time uh, in my class and they were in this band and uh, they invited me to join them and I was the youngest but uh, because they realized that I I was the guy with the melodies so I became the lead guitar player and that really filled me with so much joy it was uh, also a difficult situation uh, my father died in 1965 and I guess being in a band sort of an extended family also supported me, but the music thrilled me totally um, for several years. My main wish, my only wish, was to sound as close as possible to the originals, so to imitate them as best I, I could. But that gradually changed. There was not a specific moment when I suddenly thought, uh, I, I can't go on with this. In the late 60s, of course, turning to an age of 18, 19, reading um, philosophy and uh, 
being interested in politics. And so your mind sort of takes on a new view of the world, of your own identity. And I think um, that was the reason why I realized that I needed to overcome the traditions if I wanted to be able to express my own musical identity being free from um, the heroes of the past. And the political backdrop and the sociological changes, the upheaval, student rising, and also terrible things like the Vietnam War, those were topics my friends and I and young students with whom I sometimes met uh, were discussing. And this was clearly in the air. There was so much change in, in the art field, also in the film world with uh, Wim Wenders and Fassbinder was there, Herzog and other uh, film directors from Germany and other countries which had clearly a new take on filming. So there were inspirations coming from other fields, politics with students, demonstrations, a lot of questioning of authority everywhere. I guess that also influenced me. Later, these changes that were happening in the political, cultural world, political figures I looked up to were Willy Brandt, for instance. He became the German Chancellor, I think in 69. And he was the first to look towards the countries of Eastern Europe, trying to um, establish connections. In the end, also asking for forgiveness for the atrocities German soldiers, Nazi soldiers had committed in their countries. This was something I totally supported. Neu, by the way, played for Willy Brandt in support of Willy Brandt at one uh, event in 1972. Um, so he was a great figure. Maybe you know from history that Willy Brandt uh, knelt at a memorial in Warsaw, a memorial in uh, memory of um, the victims of Nazi terror. And that was something which enraged the conservatives, of course, how could a German chancellor kneel somewhere in a foreign country? But I was totally impressed by that. And anyway, all these, uh, this backdrop probably made it quite easy for me to develop this idea of the importance of being individual, of overcoming conservative structures, also in music, and um, being unique. It was a period of maybe two years in which I became more frustrated. I still played with the band. I felt a bit bad because when I finally told them that I would join Kraftwerk and would no longer be able to play with them or didn't want to play with them, the band broke up. But there was no choice for me, really. It was um, letting go of the past leaving it behind, the musical heroes of the past behind, uh, while still loving them, but instead the focus was on creating my own music. I already stopped the fast finger movements, for instance. That was already something I had dropped, uh, being a lead guitarist in the 60s, with um, heroes like Jeff Beck or Eric Clapton, later Jimi Hendrix. The challenge was to 
be able to move around the guitar neck with that speed and play many notes. Of course, uh, they are great guitar players, but I stopped my hand and my fingers from fast forward movements and started to instead to focus on individual notes. So um, that was already the case when I joined Kraftwerk. Um, in early 1971, I was working as a conscientious objector at a mental institute near Düsseldorf. So when some of the other um, objectors were also demonstrating with me in Düsseldorf, this one guy who was also a guitar player asked me whether I would like to join him uh, because he had an invitation to go to a recording studio, to the studio of a band called Kraftwerk in Düsseldorf. I had never heard of Kraftwerk and thought the name was rather silly, <laughs> I must say. Um, but after contemplating for a few moments, I luckily uh, decided to join him. And so I ended up in the Kraftwerk studio where Florian Schneider and Klaus Dinger were sitting on a sofa. But Ralf Hütter was playing organ and he was accompanied by a drummer, Charlie Weiss. And I thought that sounded interesting. So at some point I picked up a bass, a bass guitar, and just started jamming with Ralf. I very much enjoyed that uh, experience because Back then in 1971, I was very alone. I would, there was no one in my sight who had any similar uh, hopes, aspirations. And so it was the lucky circumstance that I did join this uh, fellow musician and went to the Kraftwerk studio where I met Klaus Dinger, Florian Schneider, Ralf Hütter, and found that I was definitely not alone. There were a few, not many, but these uh, musicians at least were on a similar path, I wouldn't say identical, but uh, of course each one of us has had their own specific ideas where they wanted to go take the music, but I could relate to them and um, that was the beginning where suddenly everything made sense and I could start creating music that was Central European basically and free from blues and had some kind of musical uh, background that had to do with the traditions of uh, my family, of our families and um, it was very easy for me to communicate musically with Ralf Hütter and I think everyone, actually I know that everyone in the room uh, realized that there was um, a real understanding, common understanding in the air. We exchanged phone numbers and I was not surprised to receive a phone call maybe one or two weeks later when uh, Florian Schneider asked me whether I would be interested in joining the band for live performances. And that's when the story really took off. With Kraftwerk, Klaus Dinger and I had some incredibly exciting concerts. Some were so explosive and I was totally blown away by the power with which Klaus Dinger played the drums and Florian Schneider also creating super exciting sounds on a treated flute with Octavider and 
fuzz and everything. So it was a very primitive, simple music, very uh, dynamic. And the good nights were amazing. But uh, when we tried to record an album, the second Kraftwerk album with Connie Plank in Hamburg, we realized that the concept which we had, it was not suited for the recording studio. We couldn't transfer the excitement of the live appearances into this sterile atmosphere of a recording studio. So after recording maybe 25 minutes, I think that's what we got on tape, we gave up and it was quite clear to all of us without probably even talking about it that we didn't want to continue working together. The problem was that both Klaus and especially Florian Schneider were very spiky characters um, with some issues going on, which made them at some times rather nasty. <laughs> But it was easier for me to imagine working with Klaus, although he was also quite a different personality, to be honest. Uh, he had traits which made it impossible for me to consider him a friend. But as an artistic collaborator, he was just incredible. And so we thought, okay, let's give it a try and work as a duo. We should book with Connie Plank a studio and then try to record what we can deliver. Slightly different concept, of course. And so that's what we did. We talked with Connie. He was immediately uh, enthusiastic. Um, it was very easy to convince Connie Plank to do something crazy because he was just as enthusiastic about developing new structures and uh, being inventive in the studio and in music. So we didn't have to push him anywhere. He just went along and helped us in a great way. Neither Klaus Stinger nor I had any experience, uh, especially me. I, I, that was the first time I really went, was in a recording studio, uh, apart from one recording with Spirits of Sound, but that doesn't really count. Klaus Stinger and I were very careful and wanted to avoid any influence or power of say by a record company and therefore we thought about how much money we could put up and scratch together the money to book the recording studio with the help of Connie Plank who put an equal share. I mean we were very optimistic really. We could only afford four nights. That was all we had, all the money we had for the four nights and we worked at night because the rates at night were cheaper than during the daytime. Although I must say, I hate working all night long. If I look back at the situation, it's, I don't know how lucky we were that it was possible to record what ended up on the first Neu album in such a short time. Yeah, we somehow managed to get music on tape. We could easily have failed, really. It was a matter of luck that we ended up with enough music on the tape to um, release the first Neue album. And these days, if I listen to a track like, especially a track like Hallo Gallo, which has 
for me, still so much of a mystery. It's like a cat, sort of. I, I look at it and I think, yeah, it is really good. And these things Connie Plank also put together, the, the guitars he mixed, my guitars, the backwards, forwards guitars, that was a great job and so impressive because um, I couldn't imagine myself being able to memorize all those parts where the guitars were great, where he could show them and at other parts where the guitars were not so good. So it was all done manually. The mix was done uh, by uh, pushing the faders up and down. And Connie Plank also did a wonderful job uh, recording the drums. That was something Connie was very much into. He had given the recording of drums a lot of thought and experimentation. And um, I think they still sound great today. We always went together into the recording room to record the basic tracks. So Klaus played drums. I played guitar on Halo Gallo. And so that was the foundation, the, the basic elements. More than 10 minutes in the case of Halo Gallo, I think nearly 11 minutes. And then the next step was to decide what to do because we didn't have a clear, precise plan of the elements that would go on top of these basic recordings. It was clear that I would play guitar and that I would try to create something that we used to call clouds, like melodies that um, change color in the sky while the motoric, I should not even use that word, but the, the car or the vehicle you're riding on moves along the highway to a distant point or maybe even the horizon. And um, a lot of that was, of course, everything happened on the spot. And it was, there were some lucky circumstances. For instance, uh, when I recorded the first overdub, I had a wonderful feedback. I had Altec lensing um, loudspeakers, my own guitar box um, I brought along and with um, fuzz and wah and this feedback, I was able to play the long syrupy uh, notes that weave through the air. And Klaus played this kind of rhythmic clack, clack, and clack, clack, clack. <laughs> Very interesting, um, also with wah pedal. In the case of Hallo Gallo, this um, quack and quack and guitar was very important. It still is very important and gives some uh, propulsive um, element. And then I recorded more melodies forwards and then Connie turned the tape around and I played more melodies. I was of course inspired by the sound of the music running backwards, something that always interests me. I love backwards sounding music and also slow down music. So this was great. I was in the recording room. I was surprised by this and of course very happy to hear the music like that. And when Connie Plank turned the tape back to, into the right direction, suddenly you had these backwards guitars mixing with the forward melodies. And the next step was, which I already described, the magic, the incredible talent of Connie Plank to memorize the good parts or the right parts where the guitars would meet in the sky. Well, it's, it's just a picture, but I feel the melodies flying around somewhere above my head and um, it's magic.
Klaus was a magnificent, powerful, determined drummer, but he was not a skilled drummer like, for instance, Jackie Liebezeit, who was a magician at the drums. He was a virtuoso, and Klaus was, like me, we were both similar in that respect, a primitive player. So he was the best Klaus Dinger impersonator, like I'm the best Michael Rother impersonator on guitar or on other instruments. And it was only very clear from the first moment when I uh, did rehearsals with Kraftwerk that his powerful drumming style enabled magnificent rides. Um, Having said this, because praising Klaus is important and recognizing his qualities, what I am a bit confused or unhappy about is when I have the feeling that people don't realize what they enjoy. They think it is the drumming, it is the combination of the drumming and all the other instruments. If you take one element away, it would not be the same. Nobody would want to listen to 10 minutes of the drums in solo or my guitars in solo. So really the, the meaning of the music comes together only in the combination of all the elements we played on all the instruments. So I don't know, uh, it's clear to me, although it's sometimes difficult to imagine how non-musicians hear music, but it is clear that the drums as a sound source are the easiest to identify probably for the audience. So you can hear this is a snare drum and that's a cymbal crashing and so on. And of course the drumming is very, very impressive, but again, The magic happens when you combine it with what gives the power, the meaning, and that the meaning comes from the musical instruments that are creating a harmonic, melodic world along with the drumming. If you imagine just one element missing in a track like Hallo Gallo, the whole thing could have easily fallen apart. It is a very dynamic song, but also it has this frailty. And I don't know really how this was possible. <laughs> uh, this beauty and this frailty, and like I said, it Even today, I'm confused and surprised and, of course, thankful for Connie, Connie Plank um, for organizing those sounds in that beautiful way. Everything could have also failed because of the lack of time. So, actually, that is something I even try to do today, although I have all the time in the world nowadays with my own recording studio and, of course, with computers, endless hours of recording possible. And if I don't finish the song today, I will do it tomorrow or next year. <laughs> But back then, everything had to be done so quickly. There was not any time really to contemplate and to fuss about details. So it was like creating something on the run.
Sonderangebot, Special Offer, sort of, that's the translation. That was the result of Klaus playing cymbals with a, a bow. I don't know if he used my bow. I played also bass with a bow and sometimes guitar with a bow. And he did very delicate sounds on the cymbals with the bow. And when Connie Plank phased, put everything into phasing, that's when suddenly these recordings get some kind of new dimension and it starts floating around. Actually, I'm not so sure really how I played that. I didn't have an Ebo at the time. So maybe it was just a guitar with a volume pedal, which I like to use also on other tracks. But maybe I, maybe thinking about it now, I think I used a bottle to play that melody on Sonderangebot. Yeah, that was, um, I didn't have a proper a slide finger, a glass tube or something like that at the time. So I used a bottle which contained a fluid for the cleaning of the guitar. <laughs> yeah, there was no real plan. So unfortunately, I cannot um, recall the order in which we approached the songs. Maybe we recorded the basic tracks on several songs and then picked one to continue and then maybe Klaus went into the studio and did the boat symbols. It wasn't so much the idea of, oh, we have to have another four minutes. It was something that we enjoyed doing. So uh, also the other tracks, apart from the the main three elements, Weissensee, Negative Land and Hallo Gallo, they were also essential for the feeling of the album. I had this guitar, which I call D guitare. It's, it's quite a pun, it's a joke, because every uh, string was tuned to the note D. And I played it with a bottle. Baum, 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 I hit it. It was, the strings were slightly higher. And this, together with a bowed bass, I think, created a drone which um, is still interesting for me. The drone hasn't gone away. And the melody I actually had already in my mind before we met in Hamburg for the recordings. And Klaus played wonderful drums on Weissensee. He was a drummer that's very important, of course, who at the same time while playing drums, had his eyesight on the whole musical picture. So he was not a drummer who was only bothered about getting his drums in a perfect way, but thinking how this certain fill or uh, stop, whatever, would help shape the sound, the song. And the melody is, of course, uh, deceptively, if you will, simple innocent and peaceful, which is not deceptive. It is meant that way.
um, harmonic changes, they were something I really thought about for quite a long time, whether they were justified at all, because it was the beginning of a, a path that went on for many years of trying to assemble one step to the next of a new musical language that was mine. So um, I wanted to avoid running into cliches or uh, traps of things that were around already. But in the case of Weissensee, I convinced myself, and I'm glad that I did, that this was um, justified, this harmonic change, because it is like breathing in and out. And so if you listen to the melody and when it comes to the point of the harmonic change, this is like breathing in, it's a tension in the body. And when on the other side it is released, it is like breathing out, exhaling, and like water coming down a waterfall, and then the drone continues. So this was something that I very much enjoyed when we had that together. It was uh, beautiful. Breathing in and then at the end of the other side, that's when it goes back to D. Sorry, I'm, you see, I'm still a primitive musician. I can't give you the, the proper expressions, which uh, there are, of course, um, proper uh, words for that movement from D to G. But it's, <laughs> it's all in my mind. <laughs> The movement on the slide ring or slide um, on the bottle was not meant to sound like blues. But there is, of course, some similarity. If you move up um, strings with a bottle or a slide finger, that is how it sounds. But yeah, it was just one simple step up and then the release of the tension and the melodies also, they are in that moment like a slightly confusing waterfall, like when things just bubble along and then the song, the drone calms down and it continues on the main forward movement. Well, it was one basic uh, melody which I had in my mind before going into the studio to record. There were not 20 melodies on my mind. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's pure luck that we got away with that. Um, very reduced input and maximum output. It was a um, result of being maybe under lucky stars and of course with the help of Connie Planck who also made that track Weissensee sound so wonderful.
Klaus Dinger was on a holiday trip with his girlfriend and he just recorded a rowing in a boat on a lake in Norway, I think it was. So this was like the title also indicates in Glück, sort of being happy. Those seagulls are guitar sounds, short um, sounds I made on the guitar. But the main element is, of course, the field recording and um, the negative land element that follows was, um, I guess, for Klaus especially, the expression of his deep frustration when the parents of his girlfriend decided to move back to Norway and they were not very happy about the relationship between Klaus and their daughter. This seems to happen a lot. It also happened to me that the parents of my girlfriend were not happy about me. But in the case of Klaus Dinger, he had this anger, which sometimes in his case uh, led to amazing creativity in later years. Uh, for instance, Hero is one wonderful example of the creative energy Klaus got out of um, these feelings of despair, of anger, frustration. And I think that Jack Hammer was even from a, could be a disappointment, but it's just some kind of a sound source we found in the studio. It was the disruption. I think it was included. No, I, I don't think I know it was included to disrupt the harmony of Im Glück, the peaceful, joyful boat ride Klaus shared with his girlfriend. And suddenly the disruption of this joy. <laughs> The phasing, and that was Connie Plunk's contribution, they added this special uh, flavor. It's like somebody, when you cook with three people and then one adds spices, special spices, and suddenly there's a new life, a new uh, color in, in the dish. And it's, it's wonderful the way Connie Plunk used phasing. He stood between two tape machines in the studio with identical mixes and then did uh, what people used to do, slow down one machine by putting his hand on the reel and then letting go in the right moment and listening to the effect of these uh, phased uh, sounds. <laughs> I played bass on Negative Land. Everything Klaus played was sort of played like a drum. So he played a Japan banjo. Also in the case of Negative Land, you see the marvelous work of Connie Plank, who 
phase the Japan banjo, which in itself is all good and fine. It, he played it very rhythmically and interesting, quite slightly dissonant. But the magic starts the moment when Connie um, added his manual phasing to this recording. And suddenly there's this, it's some kind of like a dust, a cloud of dust, which moves up and down. I don't know, just thinking of Stranger Things, something like that, you know, the series. <laughs> um, but this wall of sound which drifts above the straightforward bass and drum elements. This is the result of Connie Plank's wonderful treatment, another example of his creativity. Yeah, I hate to say this, but Klaus uttered some claims which I cannot support and maybe my memory uh, was a bit different than that of Klaus. He cannot, of course, he's no longer around, so he cannot uh, disagree or uh, contradict me. If Klaus claims that it was his Japan banjo which uh, made movement Maybe he's right, he was right, but maybe it was slightly different. <laughs> Klaus, you know, I mean, it's common knowledge, I guess, amongst the fans that um, we were in later years also on not so friendly terms. He caused a lot of problems due to his um, the development of his career and the freedom, the liberties he took with my music behind my back. But in the end, for me, I've, since Klaus has died, I prefer to focus on his great creativity, which um, enabled me to, uh, with him and Connie Plank, uh, to record that music. But some of the claims Klaus has uttered, especially in the 90s, when he was sort of living on a different planet, um, it was very difficult for me to handle that. And um, I mean, I don't know if I should even talk about this, but it's not even a secret because he said so on uh, his website back then. He was proud of having taken more than 1000 LSD trips. So that was, um, I guess, one of the reasons why he got estranged from so many people and also from me and i couldn't i couldn't uh, handle that We spent 10 years struggling to find an agreement about the Neu re-releases and we were again very fortunate when somebody appeared on the scene, somebody nobody would have expected. I don't know if he's uh, so famous in the States, but Herbert Grönemeyer is a German musician. He was also famous for his acting in films like Das Boot this famous U-boat film, but uh, he's a household name in Germany. He sells millions of albums. And when he was, he had the very 
unhappy period when his wife died in the late 90s and also his brother and he was blocked he couldn't work on music but he had still because he's a very energetic powerful person uh, wanting to create things and so he stumbled again so many coincidences um, around my life he didn't know Noi the music of Noi but he was in this photo shoot in London and somebody decided to play Hallo Gallo I think it was Noi music and um, Herbert Grönemeyer said what's that that's interesting and they told him yeah there are two German guys aha uh -huh. where can I get it oh you can't get it they are crazy they they refuse to release the music and they can't get along with each other and they are total hopeless cases and so when Herbert heard this he suddenly had this idea well this is a challenge for me I want to make this happen this music deserves to be presented to the world again because there were only bootlegs in the 90s you could find them everywhere and so he, Herbert set out on this mission to convince especially Klaus I didn't need convincing because I was always willing to release the music but Klaus distrusted people he thought everyone was there to rip him off that was the sad story of the time and um, Herbert Grönemeyer in individual talks with each of us and sometimes talking with both of us at the same time tried to find out where the problems were what prevented this music from being released and he started his own label Grönland and Neu was the first release on that label he managed to convince Klaus and I don't know, I will forever be thankful for Herbert Grönemeyer for his contribution to help Neu being presented to younger audiences, you know, not only 30 years later, but 50 years later, it's still on Grönland records and it's amazing. But I already mentioned the, the effect of lucky circumstances and that was one of the major elements also in our career. Yeah, negative land. I also see it as a positive element because I didn't share this frustration, of course. I play negative land live these days and people really enjoy it. And I also enjoy playing negative land. So it's not with a feeling of frustration. It's also another nice example of um, noise forward moving music. I think I only played the drone on that so the guitar was played by Klaus he had a 12 string guitar which only had 11 strings and slightly detuned and Klaus couldn't at that time couldn't really play guitar I think he even played it while singing
this is another example which I think is beautiful, the way he transforms his sadness. It's another example of his sadness about the loss of his girlfriend and his voice breaks and the guitar sounds helpless, sort of. And many people have problems with the track, but it is, for me, it is a very honest artistic expression of Klaus. And it's great that that track ended up on at the end of Neu One. Yeah, that was um, the experience of the whole album. We were fortunate to get away in four nights with an album. We then spent a week mixing in a different studio. Uh, we paid that studio with uh, giving away the publishing rights, which in the long run was a very bad deal, but <laughs> that's another story. When we were in the studio and we listened at the end of the sessions to what we had. I think I was quite happy, but nothing compares to coming home with a tape and playing the first Neu album to my family, to my mother, my brother and my girlfriend and seeing them being just as happy as I was and it sounded great on the home stereo and this was one of those moments which I will not forget because um, the studio situation with all the pressure and the time and the clock, studio clock running forward, counting down the last seconds, minutes of like the Johnny Cash seven minutes to go. <laughs> that was just such a beautiful moment to realize, yes, it does, outside of the studio, it does sound as great as you thought it was in the studio. And your people, your crowd, your, the people who are close to you and to your heart, they, they are happy with what you did. Yeah, well, it really feels a bit unreal to talk about uh, a span of 50 years, uh, going back to 1972 and the recording and release of the Neu album. I was still 20 years old <laughs> when I met John Frusciante in 2003 when we jammed in Hamburg, when the Chili Peppers played there. And he couldn't get enough of my explanations and you were so young <laughs> yeah well okay of course over the years first in the 80s late 80s Neu disappeared the company stopped um, pressing new copies there was no demand apart from maybe Brian Eno and David Bowie talking about Neu, but the general audience and the general idea was nobody knew the music. But then 
there were the first news from American bands picking up the ideas, talking about Neu, uh, Stereo Lab, of course, and Thurston Moore and Sonic Youth. And it was very funny when I, for the first time, heard two cool chicks listening to Neu, this phone conversation with music, Neu music in the background. At that first moment, I thought, is this a singular event? Maybe it doesn't mean much, but then the signals got stronger and stronger and Daniel Miller of Mute Records wanted to release uh, Noi and other people wanted to release Noi. And so when finally the Noi albums were re-released in 2001 all over the world, uh, it was amazing to see the reception the comments we got from David Bowie, from Tom York, from many musicians. And it's it's wonderful now to see with the Neu box set and the, the contributions of these bands and musicians that they take inspirations from the music Klaus Dinger and I did. So I don't know, I'm just uh, very grateful for those moments. In the end, I can say there was some very fortunate element working for us. It's not the result of our superior qualities. There's such a big element of fortune involved. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Noi. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase the first Noi album, including the 50th anniversary box set. Thanks for listening. <laughs>